Is God's command for us to worship him a command that comes at our expense? Right. The very connection between enjoying something Hmm. and glorifying, if you want to use the word glorify, but maybe praising is a better word, that those two things are actually inseparable. You're listening to the Prepared to Answer podcast. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And just a reminder that all of the resources that we mentioned in this episode today, you can find linked through the episode description. Welcome to another Prepared to Answer podcast. I'm Sean Walker. I'm your host for today and for this episode, and I'm with Scott. How are you, Scott? I'm fine. Good. If you're the host, am I the guest? You, you, were, the, <laughs> you were the guest every single time. <laughs> I need new guests. <laughs> Becca, <laughs> we need new guests. Can we get <laughs> someone else in here? <laughs> Can we get oh, some? Oh, dear. No, no. Always a pleasure. <laughs> uh, always a pleasure to meet with you. And uh, I wanted to, before we jump in today's topic, I had mentioned uh, on our last episode that you had written an article for YPT, mm-hmm. uh, so Mike's Ministry, just about theology and apologetics. Yeah. And just, I don't want you to go into a whole lot of detail, but just maybe touch on what you were writing about there and how it really kind of mm-hmm. influences PTA's ministry. Sure. Yeah. Well, youth pastor theologian, uh, Mike McGarry's ministry, he's one of, he's a, one of our, our team members. He's a partner. Um, we love his ministry. We think he's doing some great work. Uh, wrote a, 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 an article for him on the relationship between theology and apologetics. And I'll just give you the, the really quick, the thesis was this is that, you know, apologetics is giving a defense. And a change has happened probably in the last 20, 30 years in terms of the kinds of questions that people are asking and the kinds of challenges Christians face to uh, against the gospel. It used to be that very much the emphasis was on things related to the factuality, okay. like how do we know God exists, right? Science, philosophy, uh, let's d- demonstrate the fact of God's existence. Mm-hmm. And those questions are still in play and they're important. But but more and more in the, the, the kind of this new generation, there's been a shift that's taken place where the concern is not so much with the factuality of the existence of God, mm-hmm. but the goodness of the God who we claim exists. Okay. And so the questions are are becoming much more focused on, well, how can God be good if? Right. Right. Yeah. So very much then th- those kinds of challenges, often when it's put forward, uh, you know, often, you know, where's the evidence that God exists is are more evidential kinds of questions. Yeah. You might appeal to philosophy or science or whatever to respond to those things. Questions on the goodness of God are more often than not theological questions. Right. And okay. so, and so, the article was basically saying, you know, more and more so, theology itself. In other words, Christians having a clear understanding of the gospel and of biblical theology is in itself a form of apologetic. Right. That sometimes people's objections to Christian faith come as a result of uh, misunderstood or faulty assumptions about God. So right. bad theology. Right. And so the necessary response, or at least the first response, would be presenting them with good theology. Right. Right. So that was what the article was about. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wonderful. And people can find that article on YPT's Yeah, Youth Pastor Theologian, YPT. Encourage our listeners to to check that out. Mm -hmm. And actually probably a good segue into what we're talking about today. Yeah. And the challenge is God selfish. Right. Which is a great example of exactly that. This is a theological challenge. Right. Because it's a question on the nature of God. Right. Yeah. But we see it as an apologetic challenge and we think we need to go to the apologist and get that quick answer that we can give to that challenge. But what we're finding is it's theology we we're talking about. Yeah. Well, you know what? I mean, gen- generally understood, Sean, every Christian needs to learn to be an apologist. Right. In that we want to be prepared and, and able to give an answer. And that's what apologetics means is sure. to give a response. Sure. So we're all, we're, we're trying for Christians in general to be prepared to do that. Yeah. Good. So, yeah. So for today's episode, we're mm-hmm. talking about the challenge is God selfish. And, and we've yeah. actually had uh, supporters and, and people come to us with this challenge and said, I, yeah. I've been challenged. Yeah, with recently. This. Yeah. Recently I had someone who, who came and said, you know what, someone, a friend of mine actually leveled this challenge against me and I didn't know what to say. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So we did a little digging and yep. we actually came upon a girl by the name of Christy Burke. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and so she would call herself an exvangelical. Yeah, right? exvangelical uh, agnostic atheist would be her kind of moniker. She'd go by those under those terms. Yeah. Yeah, and so she had a a good video on this challenge. Mm -hmm. um, so she was uh, a Christian at one time and yep. stepped away from the faith, uh, and had this video on challenging the fact that God is selfish. And, yeah, yeah. And what's interesting is is she used scripture to back that up. Well, right, because she uh, she's someone who has gone through a de faith deconstruction. She would say she went through a, de a faith deconstruction process sure. and dis and determined that she could no longer believe the Christian faith she was brought up with. Right. Yeah. Right. So so she knows her Bible. Yeah. 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 Which uh, which makes it interesting and and hard for a Christian to jump on a video like that mm -hmm. and see this scripture. Yeah. And say, ooh, maybe there's some point to this. Yeah. So. We want to deconstruct uh, the video. Would that be would that be fair? Well, let's let's uh, let's uh, uh, yeah avoid maybe some of the baggage with that term. We <laughs> want to uh, evaluate right. it, yeah, okay. and and uh, analyze what she's what she said at least and evaluate her challenge. Sure. Yeah. So she starts off, and, and this would be a quote from her video. She says, "I do not see a God who is selfless and loving and humble and kind." And she would have said in other videos that that was the God that she grew up with, mm -hmm. right? That the God that she was taught was selfish, uh, selfless, loving and humble and kind. She says she doesn't see that. She sees a God who created humanity for one sole purpose. Right. So that he could be glorified. Yeah. That's yeah. her challenge and that's kind of the basis of her challenge. Yeah. And then she starts by pointing to scripture. She says, well, here's, here's what I think, but... I just don't think that. Here's what scripture actually says about that. Right. So we look to Isaiah 43, 7. It says, everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Yep. Okay. Romans eleven thirty six. For from him and to him and in him are all things. To him be glory forever. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 43, 21. The people I formed for myself, that they may declare my praise. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say this sounds like it's uh, yeah. pretty She's building selfish. a case. It's a cumulative case she's building here, right? Uh, and we move to Paul in Ephesians 3, 9, and 10. Paul says his mission is to bring the light for everyone that is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Mm -hmm. And finally, Ecclesiastes 12, 13 the end of the matter, all has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's yeah. uh, this pretty good scripture there uh, to back up her, her claim. Yeah, yeah. So she, I mean, she looks, she kind of brings out that whole, you know, this catalog of scripture and says, look, the Bible's really clear. God has, cre he, he's this creator God who's made creation and it's all about him. Yep. It's all for his glory. He's made it so that he could receive glory right. from his creation, and, and therefore she concludes that he's selfish. But then she even goes on, and she pulls your bit. She wants, she <laughs> I wants to actually, yeah, I got to give her props <laughs> for this. <laughs> she pulls out the dictionary. Yeah, I'm like, okay. okay. She, she must be watching start, sure. Prepare to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, and she says selfish. Yeah. The, the definition of selfish is lacking consideration for others or concern chiefly with own, one's own personal profit or pleasure. Right. So she says, so God admits over and over again that he created people for his own glory, mm -hmm. his own pleasure, mm -hmm. his own purpose. She says that is the definition of being selfish. So she's got the Bible. She's got the dictionary. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's a lot. That's what we deal with, Scott. <laughs> what do we say? <laughs> what do you do? What do you do? Uh, the, the liar, liar, pants <laughs> on fire defense maybe isn't the, the best <laughs> response. <right. laughs> what are we left with? Right. Yeah. So where do we start with this? We wouldn't believe that God is selfish, but she makes a pretty strong case. Yeah. And you know what? I think um, I approve. <laughs> I, I, I kind of like Christy. I, I I like her. She has a nice way about her. Sure. She's very, you know, she's kind of just kind of straightforward talking. She's she's considerate. She, for the most part, she's pleasant. Uh, and she just seems to be authentically, you know what, I believe these things, but here's my problem. 
And in this case, I mean, we have to we have to concede, uh, and she um, she knows the Bible obviously to some extent, and it does seem pretty clear from the Bible right, that God God accomplishes all things for His glory. And I mean, that seems to be the fact that the, the Bible does present God as inherently God centered. Sure. And I mean, uh, she quoted Ephesians three. I mean, this is Paul in Ephesians one. I think it's even more definitive. Sure. Uh, right, Paul says in Ephesians one six that God predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will. Paul says to the praise of His glorious grace. Drop down to verse twelve in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of His glory. Mm-hmm. Right, and drop down to verse fourteen. You are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So in one chapter, Paul hits on his glory three times. Yeah. 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 When he's un- when what he's unpacking here yeah. is the manifold mystery of God's eternal will revealed in Jesus. Like here's the whole, God's given us the whole story, the whole uh, unpacking yeah. of his eternal will in Jesus and we now see it's all for the praise of his glory. Right. Can't get around it. No. So then Burke, you know, quickly points out that anyone who exhibits this kind of thing. Right. Is obviously self-focused. Yeah. And yeah. we would say mm-hmm. wicked or even evil. Uh, yeah. And, and she, I mean, she uses, the, she uses the example of a parent. Right. Which for us, I mean, we see God as a heavenly father. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, at one point in her video, she says, uh, she uses that example. She says, well, God's our heavenly father. So like, look, let's think about this in terms of a parent. Right. Uh, imagine a, an earthly parent. If a parent, cre- she's, here's what she says. If a parent created a child so that the child could worship, love, serve, and adore and glorify them and didn't care about what the child wanted, but only wanted the child to make sure that the parent was glorified. And then t- she adds on top and then threaten their child with punishment, you know, yeah. as if this is God. If they didn't glorify them, that would be considered abuse. Mm-hmm. So she's she's drawing this yeah. parallel and saying, you know, God rightly understood is actually like an abusive parent. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah. You know, that's a that's that's quite a <laughs> sure a challenge. Sure. So all of these are pretty tough. Yeah. Right. Again, mm-hmm. just going back to scripture, she's using the dictionary. Yep. So what do we say to this? I mean, they're rhetorically compelling arguments. Mm-hmm. And I can so I, I can so appreciate. I, I got to confess, you know, we 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 found this video and I and I went and w- watched it and listened to it. Oh, it was hard to listen to. Sure it was. Like, oh, it's it's hard to hear someone level these kinds of accusations against the God I worship, who I consider to be good and loving and selfless. Right. Um, and so now imagine say you're a younger or a newer believer. Right. And someone brings this challenge to you. Yeah. And maybe all you've been brought up being taught is that we believe that God is loving and selfless, right? right? That he cares about us. And then someone has a a developed argument like this with scripture to boot, right? Yeah. I could see how someone may be a a believer who's just kind of been grown grown up just being told certain things wouldn't know what to say. And maybe that's her story too. Yeah, could be. You know? Yeah. Could really rock your faith. Right, right. Yeah. So so how do we tackle a challenge like this? Um, maybe just a, just a quick reminder, Sean. Um, I don't want to go back to kind of our, our foundation as a ministry here, Prepared to Answer. Prepared to Answer, our ministry name comes out of, right, First Peter 3.15, where Peter says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And so that's why we we do what we do. We want sure. to help Christians be ready to give a response, but we can't forget the rest of the verse. I think this is so important. Peter yeah. finish or Peter finishes by saying, "But do this with gentleness mm-hmm. and respect." Right. And this is where I want to be careful because again, when we when we confront, I'm finding more and more as Christians when we are confronted on things like social media, and I've even seen uh, Christy's gotten a, a, quite a following, but also she's gotten quite a bit of attention from Christians who don't like what she has to say. And I understand the sentiment. Sure. We don't like it because it's, it, it, it's, it's directly against the God we worship and love, but that's not, that's not licensed then to be unkind right. and to villainize her 
Right. And and I don't want to do that because actually, as I listened to her, my heart really went out for her. Mm-hmm. That that she grew up in a Christian environment, but at some point was either deceived or was not given the firm enough foundation to combat the kinds of faith doubts or faith challenges that confronted her. Sure. And and now she's in a place where she's just com- completely jettisoned it. And the thing is, she represents a large number, mm-hmm. especially of Christian young people, formerly Christian young people, who've gone on the same journey. Yeah. And so my heart goes out to them. And maybe as an aside, Scott, uh, we actually we had our board meeting this week. We have a wonderful board at PTA. Yeah. And, and the devotion was brought by one of our board members mm-hmm. about Christ coming into Jerusalem just yep. before the Passion Week and, and how he wept. Yeah over the city before he came. And it was just a reminder to us in our ministry about how love has to uh, motivate us. Right. Right. And so this verse is perfect, right? Right. right? We don't want to tear her down or tear that person down that's brought that challenge. And, and people may bring a challenge in a way that isn't loving to us, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Pointing and wagging fingers and, yep. and trying to belittle you. Yep. Uh, and yet we look to Christ in scripture and, and how he loved first. Right before before he gave an answer, <laughs> he loved people who heaped abuse upon him. Right <laughs> as he hung there on the cross. Yes, yeah. So so I anyway just I just wanted to put, to yep. put that in first to set the tone of our discussion um, because yeah I mean uh, the Christie Burks of the world I, I think as Christians our hearts should should grieve yep. and we ought to be yeah uh, weep for them yeah and and genuinely want to see them recover their faith. Yeah. And I'm I'm hopeful that that the gospel is still the power of God for the salvation of all who believe that Jesus loves them still. Yeah. And um and who knows maybe this uh, descent into doubt and skepticism and even mm-hmm. agnosticism maybe is a journey out of a an ill-formed faith mm-hmm. into true faith. Who knows? Sure. So we'll leave that in God's hands. But anyway, for our purpose, how do we respond to this objection? Yeah. The objection of, you know what, all things on surface, the God of the Bible is a selfish God because he's made everything about himself. It's all for him. Sure. Okay. How do we okay. respond? Yeah. Three, th- I want to go through three things, Sean. We'll just give a kind of, to help you and I give some direction to our conversation. One, I want us, I want us to say some th- clarifying things about selfishness by definition. I like right. Christy. She wants, starts with a dictionary. <laughs> right. Let's start with the words we, we use and yes. understand their meaning. Good start. Secondly, I want to give a, a, a short rebuttal to her use of parent analogy. The, yeah. Let's, let's draw an analogy from an earthly parent to God and see, you know, and, and use that to draw conclusions. And then the third is, I think, uh, what, we, what we might not have seen is there is a hidden assumption within her objection sure. that I think we need to identify. Yeah. Okay. Um, because her entire objection rests on the hidden assumption. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, let's hit that dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> let's get that dictionary jingle. <laughs> Becca. <laughs> it's Scott's dictionary time. All right. So Christy rightly defines selfish. Uh, I did. I Googled it, and I think she got the same. Google usually brings back the Oxford Dictionary okay. as the default, and sure. I think she got the same one. Selfish means lacking consideration for others or being concerned chiefly with one's own personal profit or pleasure. In response, though, let's see where the, where the proper emphasis for selfish needs to lie. Okay. And careful to, not to think that simply the pursuit of personal pleasure is not de facto selfishness. Okay. And here's an example. Yeah, what do you mean by that? Here's an example. Yeah. It's not always selfish to pursue your own pleasure. And here's a a very simple example. Okay. Um, Many of our listeners and viewers might enjoy Chick-fil-A. Oh. Especially if you're south of the border. Sure. We're starting to get Chick-fil-A up here in Canada. It's not as popular as down in the States. No. But interestingly, I mean, the the, the owners of Chick-fil-A are Christians, uh, professedly so. But interestingly, one of the things that they have uh, asked I guess, trained their, their owner man, owners and managers and staff to do is if anyone says thank you, yeah. their response, they, they are trained to respond, my pleasure. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Which is a real kind of, it's, it's kind of a holdover of Southern hospitality. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and actually, I think originally, the, it's my pleasure that that response, uh, I just looked it up. 
yeah. was attributed to uh, Hilton. Oh, the Hilton, okay. Yeah. The, the founder of the Hilton Hotel chains yeah. who saw It's My Pleasure as a response that evokes the right kind of, that's the right kind of posture we want towards sure. those we're serving in the customer service industry. Yeah. But it reflects something. Yeah. It reflects the fact that actually there is a form of pleasure, a, re a very real form of pleasure that we can pursue through the selfless act of serving others. Right. For sure. So, yeah, like I can think of uh, those that serve, say, the poor or stuff that don't have a faith yeah. com component. And I've often thought, oh, that's interesting, right? That what is your motivation right. for serving these people? Yeah. It is quite possible, and I would argue that it is partly mm -hmm. because they find pleasure in that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't have time to develop this, but because God has created us in his image, I think there is something, you're right, it doesn't have to, you don't have to be a believer for this to be true. There is something wired into our being as image bearers yeah. that we genuinely receive pleasure right. in serving others in meeting the needs of others. And I think that is why you see not just Christians, right. but people even without faith who are devoted to you know, things like the, uh, the field of medicine True. or humanitarian relief. They do all these things. They don't do them because they feel there's some kind of universal duty they have to fulfill. They do it because it genuinely brings them pleasure. True. They receive something for having served other people or met their needs and it brings them joy and it brings them satisfaction. And we wouldn't look at them and point at them and go, look at that selfish person. No. In the soup kitchen. No. Serving that's right. That's right. We don't. Yeah. Right. We would never do that. Sure. Um, now, obviously, there are some who may do those kind of things out of some kind of uh, perverse sense of, of guilt. Yeah. Right? Like the, they sure. have to balance the universal scales or whatever it is. Yeah. But many well-meaning people serve simply because it, it brings them pleasure yeah. to serve others. So just to be clear, just talking about the definition of selfish. Yes. When we're looking at the definition, we need to realize that the stress of the meaning of selfishness is not on the pursuit of personal pleasure. Right. But it's the other part of the definition. Lacking consideration for others. Right. In other words, selfishness is not the pursuit of pleasure per se. It's the pursuit of pleasure that comes at the expense of others. Right. I'm putting myself ahead of you. Sure. Yeah. That's selfishness. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's, let's jump to her analogy with the parents. Okay. Uh, yeah. That, that well, seemed fairly reasonable. Well, what do you think about that? Yeah. Right. We talk as God as a heavenly father. Yeah. We have kids. We discipline kids. God disciplines us. It seems like a fairly right. solid analogy. Right. So her, so her point is, look, at, if we saw a parent. Doing this. Who yeah. did that. Yep. And made the child's life, your life is all about bringing glory and honor to me. Yes. We'd say that parent was an evil parent. So, okay, fair enough. But is that a fair comparison? Uh, God to parents. Okay. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe it well, isn't a direct. Right. Let's, yeah. let's look at the, let's look at the, uh, sure, God's our heavenly father. There's, a, there is this parent analogy, but where does the analogy break down? What are the. What are the, maybe the essential differences? Sure. Well, we didn't, we didn't create our kids right. from nothing. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yes. Parents don't create children. No. We beget children. Right. And once we have children, those children are essentially equal to us in terms of they're a human, mm -hmm. we're a human. Right. We have different roles, but yeah. essentially we're the same. Yeah. That has never been the case with God and us. No. No. We're not equals. We may think some people may pursue, well, right? Yeah. But we aren't. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. In terms of equality, in terms of human nature and human rights, parents and children are on equal footing. Right. 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 And also because parents don't create, we don't create our children. God creates them. Right. He's the creator. Yeah. Therefore, the, the, the proper the proper understanding of parenthood is not ownership. No. Right. But stewardship. Children are given to us yeah. by someone else, by God. Right. Not to own as our property. They're not for us. Right. And that and that and that is and that becomes a problem when we try to make children for us. Right. That the purpose of my child is to somehow fulfill my life or no. complete my life. That's when children actually become idols. Right. 
And that's where things become you know, dysfunctional sure. And, sure. and perhaps abusive. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So the analogy would be better that, you know, I, I painted or I made a painting. I created a painting. I own that painting. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. I don't paint. Yeah. And it would be awful if I did. Yeah. But that is where I would own a creation where a child is not. Yeah, sure. So if you, if it was in terms of, you know, what's something that you cre you actually do create yes. that you could claim ownership over, a painting would be a good analogy. Yes. And so you would rightfully have rights to say, that's my painting. Right. And I, I deserve credit for that. So if I came along and said, nice painting, I'm going to take credit for that. We would think that's wrong. We would think that's wrong. That was unjust. Yes. Because you're the creator of that painting. Right. So don't you rightfully deserve credit for, for it? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's for your- Glory. Recognition. <laughs> hey, yes. good job. Yes. You're a great painter. Yeah. Or not. <laughs> it it would not be. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So there's a, that's probably a better analogy. Right. So that's where, I, I think that's where her, her use of that, that example breaks down is that it, there, there isn't an equivalence between human parents and God right. as our heavenly father. Right. Because yes, he's our heavenly father, but he's first our creator. Right. He, he doesn't just beget us. He created us. Yeah. Okay. So we've talked about uh, the analogy between parents and God, and, and maybe that isn't the right one, and one that we could look to and say, yeah, well, it's that not makes a sense. fair. It's not a fair comparison. No, no. No. So I don't think it's helpful. Sure. In that regard. Sure. Okay. So the hidden assumption. Yeah, and and I think this is what the, the real key to maybe yeah. responding to this kind of challenge. Notice how, and we go back to something she, Christy said. Yeah. Notice how she inserts the idea of conflicting rights into her objection that she uses with parents. Right. She says, parent created a child to worship them. What if a parent created a child to worship them and didn't care about what the child wanted? Right. But made it all about them. Right. But first of all, parents, not a great, it's not a fair comparison or it's not a, uh, an equivalent comparison. But secondly, is God's command for us to worship him? a command that comes at our expense. Right. And now I feel like we're kind of getting into a little theology. Yes. Here. Yes. Yes. Okay. You know, uh, rather than, rather than me unpacking this, I'd like to, um, this, this conversation actually happened quite a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. John Piper, one of my pa favorite pastor theologians was interacting with, uh, a, an editorial letter written to the London financial times back in 2003. Okay. And it was a man by the name of Michael Prouse mm -hmm. who was writing about his difficulty with the notion of worship. So this is exactly what we're talking it, about. He, the exact same argument. Here's what he said. He said, worship is an aspect of religion that I always found difficult to understand. Suppose we postulate an omnipotent being who, for reasons inscrutable to us, decided to create something other than himself. Why should he expect us to worship him? We didn't ask to be created. Our lives are often troubled. We know that human tyrants puffed up with pride crave adulation and homage, but a morally perfect God would surely have no character defects. So why are those people on their knees every Sunday? Right. He's talking, basically, he's talking about Christians. Sure. So basically the same response, what, what I, I wanted to, to go there, because he's got the same objection as Christy Berg, but I just found John Piper's response hmm. so helpful. Here's what John Piper said, he was, as if he was writing back to Mr. Prowse. He said, Dear Mr. Prowse, I don't understand why you assume that the only incentive for God to demand praise is that he is needy and defective or selfish. Mm -hmm. This is true for mere humans. But with God, there is another possibility. What if, as the atheist Anne Rands once said, admiration is the rarest and best of pleasures? Mm -hmm. Okay. And what if, I, as I wish Anne Rand could have seen, God really is the most admirable being in the universe? Would this not imply that God's summons for our praise is, in fact, the summons for our highest joy? And I, I want to tease that out for a bit here. Right. This, this idea of admiration as the best form of pleasure. So basically saying glorifying something would give us the best pleasure. Well, the, the, the very connection between enjoying something mm -hmm. and 
glorify, if you want to use the word glorify, but maybe praising is a better word, Mm -hmm. that those two things are actually inseparable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's think about that for a second. Think about the things that we enjoy the most. Right. Do we often keep it to ourselves? Right. Yeah. What what happens when we really enjoy something? when we really enjoy things, we get quite animated. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. Right. That's right. Sure. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, as, uh, years ago, C.S. Lewis, he wrote a book called The Reflections on the Psalms. And he, talking about his own journey as a, as a skeptic, as an atheist at the, at the, at the start, but as a thinker, con- confronting these realities and trying to make sense of them, these realities of worship and the the belief in God and all those things, and trying to make sense of them. And one of the things that he struggled with was the whole notion of praise, which of course is is infused through the scriptures. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And one of the things he said was this, he said, the most obvious fact about praise, whether of God or anything else, always used to strangely escape me. He says, I thought of it in terms of compliment or approval or giving honor, right? So if I'm praising you, I'm, I'm giving you, right? You're getting the honor, you're getting the approval, you're getting the praise. Mm -hmm. But he says, I'd never noticed that all enjoyment actually spontaneously overflows into praise. He said, the world rings with praise, lovers praising their mistresses, readers their favorite poet, walkers praising the countryside, players praising their favorite game. Praise of weather, wish, wines, dishes, actors, motors, horses, colleges, countries, history. He goes on and on and on. He said, I had not noticed how the humblest and at the same time most balanced and healthy mind praises most. Hmm. While the crank, the misfits, and the malcontents praise the least. In other words, the people who find no enjoyment in anything are the malcontents. Yes. They never have anything good to say. Mm-hmm. They never have any praise to give. Yeah. They're unhappy. Right. But the people who enjoy the most, who are the most joyful, are the ones who have the most good to say, the most praise to give. Yeah. For whatever it happens to be. Yeah. To, to me, that was a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a fascinating observation, which for Lewis, in Lewis's mind, and I think he was right, well, and this is, this is how he summarizes or he sums up his observations. Here's his conclusion, and I think he's correct. He says, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses our joy, but completes the enjoyment. It is enjoyment's appointed consummation. That, that changes. Yes. Yeah. So Piper's point, and here is how I would want to challenge the hidden presupposition in Christie's argument yeah. is that God demands our worship contrary to what we actually want. Right. Where really, rather than seeing it being God robbing us of what we want by demanding our worship, God's command for us to praise him is really an act of God's selflessness by inviting us to enjoy the greatest possible object of joy and delight that we could ever possibly know, right. Right. which is himself. And that plays out in, you see our pursuit of all types of pleasures that never fully satisfy. Right. And so right. we're always yearning to be fulfilled. Mm-hmm. And I think this is part of that answer. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, we uh, we it would take us on a bit of a bunny trail to unpack that that sure. that observation there, Sean. You're right because it's like we do and that we find so many things in this life and in this world that we enjoy, but that enjoyment is finite, right? Right. This is this is diminishing return on worldly enjoyment. Yeah. Uh, d- regardless of all the many good things, and and as a result, so often. The diminishing return results in, in, in certain cases, in addictions. Sure it does. Right? I enjoyed that glass of wine. The next one didn't quite have the same. Right. So I need, right? And so on and so forth, whether that's relationships or sex or, or substances or whatever it happens to be. Yeah. But God is the ultimate object of enjoyment. Right. And there's no diminishing return. Rather, the more we come to enjoy him, we simply will enjoy him more and more. We can never tap him dry, right? 
Right. Yeah. Um, so, and, yeah. so is there scripture to back this well, up? I mean, yes, absolutely. Christy had <laughs> hers. <laughs> she had her scriptures, right? Yeah. But her, her, she was simply trying to substantiate her point that God has made it all about Him, right. and He has. Right. But the hidden assumption is all about Him at our expense. Right. But that's not borne out in Scripture, especially when Scripture speaks about worship. You go through the Psalms over and over again. The, the psalmist doesn't worship mm-hmm. out of some compulsion, but over and over again, the Psalms are declarations of worship as true joy and satisfaction. Uh, listen to Psalm 19, 9 to 10. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are much more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. Mm-hmm. And in Psalm 139, the psalmist writes, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. They're precious. Mm-hmm. I, I, I reflect upon, I dwell upon, I, I, I unpack and look at the thoughts of God as expressed in Scripture, right? his commandments, his word, his will. And the psalmist is saying, these are precious. They're like treasures to me. I, I, I look at them and I understand the, the voice and the mind of God, and it's just a delight to me. Psalm 84, uh, 10 to 11 says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Hmm. Oh God, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord is a sun and a shield, and the Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless before him. Hmm. God is our reward. That's the Christian gospel. Right. That that the reward for turning to God through Jesus and repentance of our sin mm-hmm. is not some kind of of heavenly, you know, it's all, it's not like a scale like or or you know, if you do this, you'll get this. Right. God's the reward is God says, "Come to me, mm-hmm. and in me you find your reward." Right. He he's the object. Right. Heaven is, yeah, it talks about heaven and pearly gates and all the rest. Th- th- those, are, those are mere descriptors sure. to try and, if, and to give this pictorial kind of blissful vision of the place where God dwells. But the point is, God is there. That's what makes heaven heaven. heaven. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, Scott, just wanted to kind of go back to where we started with in terms of our discussion about the fact that apologetics is, can be, should be about theology. Yeah. And this was a great example of that, yeah. that someone has come, challenged you and said, your God is selfish. Mm-hmm. And and we may take a step back and they may throw some scripture at us yeah. and we might go, oh, no. But what we need to do is step back and understand who God really is. Right, right. And and that's that's ultimately the key. You're right, Sean. Of course, r- packed in there, though, is the reality that ultimately that's only possible through the eyes of faith. Right. Right? That, yes. That only, it's only through the illumination of the Holy Spirit that we can see clearly mm-hmm. to see who God is. But having said that, I think it's worthwhile, as we're, again, we're, we're trying to equip, equip Christians to respond. Uh, it's hard, especially the Old Testament, yes. it's hard to work from the Old Testament to, you know, presenting God is truly selfless. Yeah. Where the Christian can, can quickly go, though, and where we ought to immediately go, is to Jesus. Yeah. Who, as Paul says in Philippians 2, right, though being in the very form of God, I mean, he was God, yeah. eternally God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, did not consider equality or staying in that in that in that exalted state mm-hmm. something to be grasped a hold of and clung to by his fingernails, but but rather in humility he became a servant. Right. He came into this world to die mm-hmm. for us. Yeah. He took our place on that cross, he sacrificed himself for us out of the selfless love that is at the very heart of who God is. Right? We we always need to point back to Jesus. And he's our anchor. Right. 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 Um, yeah. And of course, Paul said that, you know, God, God who said, let light shine out of darkness, the creator, mm-hmm. let there be light, caused his light, the light of who he is to shine through the gospel in the face of Christ. Mm-hmm. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, that's a great, great place to end. Mm-hmm. Uh, as always, we appreciate you listening and, and watching. I uh, encourage you to share, like, and subscribe. Uh, if you have any questions about what we've talked about or any questions in general, we'd love to hear from you. Info at preparedanswer.org or you can leave a comment in the comment section. Until next time, God bless. You're listening to the Prepared to Answer podcast. Don't forget to like and subscribe and help us equip even more people to think like Jesus by sharing with your friends and family. If you have questions or comments regarding this episode or any other, feel free to email us at info at preparedtoanswer.org or contact us through Facebook or Instagram at preparedtoanswer.org.